tonight's festivities. Our moderator is going to be Kathy Elliott, and I'm just going to turn it over to her. Probably she's better. Hello, I'm Kathy Elliott, and um, I'm a Northampton native. I was born and brought up in Florence and moved to Leeds about 40 years ago, and I never left Northampton because I love Northampton. Um, I think the reason that I was asked to do this was one, I live right across the street. <laughs> Two, I like to talk. <laughs> and three, I haven't decided on a candidate. I haven't decided on who I'm going to vote for as yet. So this is going to be very helpful to me, and I hope it will be very helpful to all of you. So I just wanted to go through the format a little bit because this is brand new to me. Um, I've never done this before. You'll have to bear with me. But my understanding is that Mr. Bartley won the coin toss. So he will answer three questions that have already been determined. And after the first question, he has two minutes to answer. And then Mr. Narkowitz will have a 30 second rebuttal. And then they'll, they'll take a question from the audience. And the second, right, with one question at a time. Right. Right. So one, then one from, yes. And then the second question will be reversed. Mr. Narkowitz will answer, and then Mr. Bradley, Bradley will have a 30 second rebuttal. We'll take another question from the audience, and we'll have one other question, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So I hope that works for everybody. Um, we want it to be sharp, respectful, and not too long if we can. So, yes. Do each of us have two minutes for each question? Is that no, you're going to have two minutes to start. And he will have a 30 second rebuttal. And on the next, okay. unless you want to change them, and on the next question, he will have two minutes. Okay. 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 There's three questions, one at a time, but in between, we're going to take questions from the audience, one question each. Okay. And then at the end, okay? Okay, so I guess if there are any questions, the first one. Oh, it's exactly right, I'm sorry. We are going to have a two minute opening statement. So. I wish to uh, thank the Leeds Civic Association and especially Ward 7 City Councilor Jean Casey for making tonight's event possible. Uh, without Jean's uh, leadership, this event would not have happened. So thank you, uh, Eugene. Uh, this evening's forum is not about the two individuals sitting before you. It is about the community we call Northampton. And it is about the people, and all of the people, all of us, who live here. And it is about what we cherish and love about our community, and about our hopes and dreams for our community. For the first time in over a decade, there is a job vacancy for the position of mayor. You, the voters of Northampton, are the employers. In addition to examining the resumes for career experience and leadership qualifications, you must assess which candidate has the best understanding of the challenges we face as a community and what we can and must do as a community to respond to these challenges. There are enormous economic and environmental problems facing this nation in every community within it. As I said two years ago, the most significant impact on the future of our community is that the working middle class is finding Northampton an increasingly difficult place in which to survive. With that as a framework, we must find ways to better use our economic resources, our environmental resources, and our people resources. The next mayor will be required to find new ways of doing things and must possess the leadership qualities of creativity, courage, and wisdom. I hope I have the opportunity tonight and through the rest of the campaign season to prove to you I am that candidate. Thank you very much.
good evening, everybody. I want to also begin by thanking uh, my colleague, Ward 7 City Councilor Gene Casey and the Lead Civic Association for organizing tonight's event, uh, and, and all of you for coming out tonight to, to, hear, to hear our two candidates talk. I was born and raised in Western Mass in a large working class family of nine kids. My parents taught me the value of hard work and instilled a strong ethic of community involvement and service. I enlisted in the Air Force after high school and served on active duty and as a member of the Mass Air National Guard. I put myself through UMass as, as, using my veterans benefits and by holding as many as three jobs a semester. After college, I was a staff member to three Democratic members of Congress, working on a broad range of federal policy and budget issues. I next served as Congressman John Olver's District Economic Development Director, working to bring federal support to communities across western Massachusetts and leading a staff based in three offices throughout the district. When we started our family, I stayed home with our children so my wife could finish her medical training and begin her career. It was the most challenging and rewarding job I've had. And while my focus was on my family, I was able to immerse myself in neighborhood and community issues and serve the city through sustained work with organizations like the Northampton Education Foundation, volunteering in my kids' schools, and serving on city boards, including the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Transportation and Parking Commission. In 2005, my neighbors in Ward 4 elected me their representative to the city council. In 2009, the city elected me councilor at large and my colleagues elected me city council president. I've worked with people across Northampton on issues including traffic, energy, education, economic development, the budget, and open government. I've created policies and programs aimed at keeping our community strong. I've also learned the nuts and bolts of how our city functions and an understanding and appreciation of the challenges we face as a community. My experience at the federal, state, and local level combined with my record of community service and service on the City Council, has uniquely prepared me to lead Northampton. I am the candidate with the positive vision and the proven record of leadership and results who can move our great city forward. And I look forward to tonight's conversation. Okay, thank you. Our first question, which will be answered first by Mr. Bardsley, is, the issue of city employee morale is always a difficult one. Do you think we need to do more? And if so, what are your thoughts? I think uh, employee morale is probably one of the biggest problems uh, facing Northampton. Uh, there is a, uh, a very significant uh, morale problem, and I think that varies probably from department to department. Um, when you're working in the public sector, and most of the, uh, the money uh, that, uh, it, that the, it, the entity has, whether it's a city or a state government, but most of that goes into salaries. Um, the public sector is very uh, employee-oriented in that sense. And when there has to be a cutback, inevitably it's going to uh, um, affect employees, either in terms of layoff or reduced salaries. So that's always a problem. But in dealing with that problem, and I have had done that both as a uh, president of a labor association when I was a teacher as also as an administrator, but you do you deal with that issue with respect and integrity. You don't go after your employees and try to browbeat them or um, make other accusations about them in, in public. That is not the way to foster respect. And so we need to be more respectful of the employees. Some of the specific things that I would do is go around and have sessions where I talk. As the mayor, I will talk and meet with the employees as groups directly with them. They have asked for that. I have met with some groups already. They want to establish that dialogue. I will listen to their ideas. I will take their input on things like long-range planning and budget building. Um, so I will very much have a dialogue with the, the, the employees, and I will respect their unions and respect their contracts once they are negotiated. And I think when we look at some of the behaviors that have happened last year with the teachers and uh, two and a half years ago around the override debate, um, I think there was some very disrespectful behavior of the employees that was not necessarily wrong. So I have. 30 seconds. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I think obviously we, we, um, our city employees are the heart and soul of city government. I mean, they're, they're what make, uh, make it hum. They're the people that deliver the services. They're the people who deliver. 
for education in the classrooms. Uh, they're the people who help you with your birth certificate or register to vote. And we've gone through very difficult economic times over the last 10 years, and we've had to ask our employees to make a lot of sacrifices budgetarily in order to not lay them off. So I think it's, it's critical that we focus on employees and we focus on retaining them and providing them with opportunities to earn a good wage and be able to thrive and move up through the system uh, that we've created. Um, in terms of ways that I would try to address it, again, quickly here, um, I think some of, the, um, some of the work that we've done in terms of uh, uh, in the budget process, and going out and meeting with departments and, and going through the budget process with them, that's something I would want to do. So that city employees, like citizens, have an understanding of the budget and have an understanding of the issues that we're facing. I also think it's important to work on, uh, many of our departments have set up employee recognition programs, which have been great when they come to city council. I think I'd like to try to implement more of a citywide employee recognition program to recognize the contributions of city employees and make that known to their fellow citizens. So those are a couple of quick ideas in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> yeah. should have, we should have had him two minutes to answer the same question. Well, let's that's do that then. Yeah. Okay, so that's fine. Yeah, I, I should have said something. To that? You actually went over to you. He did okay. let you go. It's he did let you go. For okay, I, I, just, I was a little confused because the format I thought was going to be two minutes. Yeah, two minutes, two minutes, and then a rebuttal so. from the other. Okay. Yeah, so you've still got a minute. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> Thank you. So, like I said, yeah. I'm new at this. All right. <laughs> Tell you what, <laughs> let's end that question, go to the next question. Each gets two minutes. How's right. that? Well, the next question is going to be from the audience. <laughs> go ahead. Good. Do you want to come? Sure. Um, my question has to do with uh, something that was brought up on the Bill Newman show. I think it was two weeks ago. A caller called in and asked about the waiver for the landfill for the expanded land. And I would like to know uh, if you will make a promise that you will return the waiver. I know that one of the, I, I know Councilor Narcwood said he would, uh, that there was no need to return the waiver. So I would just like to have you reiterate that. And if you don't think it's necessary to return the waiver, please explain why you think it's, there's a reason to keep the waiver. So, You're going to get two minutes. He gets the first. He gets the first. <laughs> You're first. There you go, David. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so the question that you referred to was about the issue of when the city applied to DEP to expand the landfill, they were granted a waiver in that application process of certain groundwater uh, regulations. And, uh, and the city was allowed to proceed. They went ahead and put in place a um, groundwater drinking water protection zone that exempted the landfill from that. Uh, when we reached the point in the process where the decision was made to close the landfill, uh, uh, several counselors, including my, my, myself and Councilor Taisley and Councilor Marianne Barge and Councilor Schwartz, brought forth legislation reinstating that water protection zone and eliminating the exemption for landfills in our local ordinance, but basically returned it back to the way it was under state law. So the effect of that was to essentially nullify the, the exemption that we had been given by the DEP. Now in terms of whether or not there's a waiver, I, I'm not exactly sure if there's a physical waiver. I think what we did is we applied for this, we were granted uh, the ability to, to um, to bypass the state law, we've now decided we're not going to do that, and we've taken the extra step of passing a local ordinance that essentially returns it to a drinking water supply area that you cannot expand the landfill over. So um, if there's a waiver, if there is an actual waiver that can be given back, happy to give that back, but I think I've done even better by putting in place a law that eviscerates the waiver that was given to us by the state and returns us to the drinking water protection uh, zone uh, that's traditional with all of our drinking water protection zone and drinking water protection zones across the state, which do not allow landfills in them. So that's my position on it. Short and simple, I will return the waiver. And if there isn't a physical waiver, I will make a representation of one and 
return that, but I will return the waiver. And the, the, the voters spoke uh, loudly on the referendum um, across the city. They gave the uh, city government, the, those who were proposing the expansion over the aquifer, they gave them the opportunity to make their case. And in every single precinct, they failed. They failed to convince the voters that that was a necessary good thing. So I, I will return it. Um, uh, myself, along with uh, Ward 6 Council Mary Ann Labarge, exercised leadership on this issue. We brought it before the council. They could have put it on the ballot. They declined. They dropped the ball. It went to the uh, citizens to, uh, to put it on. We worked with the citizens to put that on, on the ballot. So at the, the measure that um, the ordinance that the city council uh, passed recently was after all that work was done. The, the leadership was already uh, supplied. The voters had made their statement. And the thing about an ordinance, ordinances can be overturned. Ordinances can be uh, uh, changed. So it is, it is not uh, a, a more definitive way of saying no than returning the waiver. Once that waiver is gone, it is gone. And good ratings, we, uh, we don't need that waiver anymore. Again, I guess I, uh, the question was about whether there, there was a waiver and it could be returned. It could be returned. Uh, the the uh, waivers could also be reapplied for. So I'm not sure the physical act of returning a waiver uh, guarantees that someone's not going to apply for a waiver in the future. So it's the same thing as an ordinance. But again, the critical piece was when the city made its decision, uh, four of us councilors and the entire council uh, voted on a measure to uh, put in place a water supply protection zone that banned landfills in that area. So uh, that is the key piece that happened, and that's essentially what overruled the waiver from the state. So happy to return it and say, sorry we broke it, uh, but here you go, you can have it back. It doesn't apply anymore to Northampton. Okay, the second question is, a sound capital improvements program and or policy is critical for the well-being of the city. Please explain your ideas in regard to priorities. In terms of the process, we need to look at that process and see what the key components are. And one of the things, there needs to be an ongoing evaluation of what the needs are of, of the city. And that comes most often through departments, um, we have to make sure that, they, again, there's a role for employees there in bringing forward needs, that these uh, needs get identified and then they're brought forward at the committee so we can get an overall picture of what the needs are within, within the city. And um, there have been uh, great uh, strides made in over the last few years on that. I think sometimes in the past that we were caught off guard with some needs um, uh, coming up very, very quickly that we were not aware of. So within each department, we need to make sure that those, uh, the, the capital improvement needs are being identified ahead of time and that they're being brought forward. And then we need to do a planning process where we can plan those out. We need to know what they are and anticipate them. Um, we run into a lot of chaos when needs come up at unexpected points. So we need to prevent that more and more. Um, the, the committee probably could be strengthened by having another counselor on the committee. We've looked at that in the past. I, I pushed it once before. I would suggest it again and to give it more of a role for the council to play in capital improvements. And we really need to strengthen the planning part of, of capital improvements and then in communicating those to, to the public so they know what they are and what these big uh, projects are that are coming down the park. Sorry. Um, so for folks at home who don't know what our capital improvements program is, uh, every year in the city budget we allocate a certain percentage of our budget. It's uh, generally in the range of about two to two and a half percent. Um, and we put that aside for long-term projects school roofs, uh, roads, uh, uh, fixing boilers, buying vehicles. 
and we bond that out over 20 years. And, we, and that's how we make those long-term improvements that we can't afford in the, in the course of a budget year. So there is a planning process for that. In fact, uh, earlier, before I came here today, I was at a finance committee with uh, Councillor Casey and Councillor Barge. We had the Director of Central Services in who was giving us an update on their energy capital program where we've been making capital improvements uh, to our city's energy systems. Um, and he was giving us a preview of some of the issues that they're looking at in the coming year. Some roof issues, some, some, uh, some drainage issues. And so the capital improvement program is, is, is critical to get input from all the departments, to get all of the, uh, the potential projects that are coming up in the future, what vehicles are getting too old and may need to be replaced. Um, and then bringing all that information together through the capital improvement process, vetting it, uh, prioritizing it and bringing forth what are the key priorities. Now, I know that in the, in, in the walking around the city that I've done, I hear a lot from people that our roads and our sidewalks are a key capital improvement priority that we need to focus on. Uh, that's one that I've heard a lot about. And we've made some investments in the capital improvement program in the next couple of budget years where we put additional monies in. But I think in setting priorities for the capital plan, that is an issue that we really need to look at. We have a big backlog of road projects. Uh, we have roads that are falling into disrepair, and uh, we, need to, we need to think about it as a community, how are we going to make investments to, to repair those long term? Some other communities have bonded some bigger projects to really tackle some of those. That may be something we can look at. Um, I also think we have to make sure that we're looking at our fleet of vehicles. Uh, I know the DBW had a lot of issues last year with old vehicles that had broken down during storms. We bought them some new ones, but I think we have to get into a regular vehicle maintenance program because it's either you pay now or you pay later. And it's, and it's smart to think ahead at what we need and how we can fit that into the overall budget. The, the challenge is uh, staying on our priorities once they've determined. And I think one of the problems that has happened in the past and in the recent past is that expenditures come up or proposals are brought forward and that are not um, reflected in the priorities. Uh, there was recently a letter to the editor by the uh, president of the Firefighters Union about a series of um, expenditures that they thought were not priorities at this time and that there were other priorities that the uh, city needed to be, uh, pay attention to. Similar with the uh, issue on the uh, infamous bucket loaded debate. So that is the uh, that's the challenge for, for the uh, the council. Thank you. So we will get a question from the audience if there's staying on here. I'm David Corbett, lifelong citizen. And uh, I want to say about the city employees, they all do great work. City Hall, collector's office, Board of Public Works. But to see those people working in the conditions that they are, I heard no mention of the buildings. The Board of Public Works building is in chaos, as you saw the pictures. The uh, windows up here have mildew. What are we going to do about the projects, the capital improvements on the building, and getting the people in safe working conditions? Yeah, um, in terms of, uh, again, some of the issues that we were talking about today at this meeting earlier were some of the window replacements that we were doing that are ongoing right now in many of our city buildings for energy efficiency. And in terms of building projects, we have been trying to, I was really proud of the role that I played on the police station building committee which was to try to take a really old and outdated police station and replace it with a modern state-of-the-art uh, facility that provided good working conditions, not only for the police, but for the community and for victims of crime. Uh, and so if anyone who's driven by there today can see the shape that's finally taking shape of the police station as it, as it, as it uh, moves along in construction. Um, and, and buildings are an important part of, uh, of, of the overall capital plan. I know the DPW has been a long-standing issue. They're, they're working in very unsafe conditions there, and we're trying to make some decisions now about whether or not we can move forward uh, and improve facility on the DPW. Uh, we've made improvements to all of our schools. We still have some schools that need some updates as well. So that's a big part of the capital improvements program, 
is how do we make sure that city buildings, which people work in, uh, as well as uh, citizens come into every day, um, are, are comfortable and, and clean and safe. I will say the one thing, the great feedback we've been hearing about the energy improvements that we've made to that capital program is that people are, are finding that the buildings are more comfortable, that there's more even heat, uh, that uh, in the summer they're more comfortable. We're still working out some of the controller issues, but again, we're not only going to save about 20 to 27 percent of our energy bills, we've not only weaned ourselves off of, almost completely off of oil, uh, but we've also created buildings that are more comfortable for both the people who work there as well as the, uh, the citizens who come in every day for the services that our employees provide. In my uh, years on the City Council, I've been involved in a number of uh, projects around buildings. I was on the, uh, the leadership of the, uh, the override for the building improvements for the middle school, and I was the co-chair of the, uh, the override committee for the expansion and improvements of the high school. And both of those, we had to go out to the community and, and argue the case why they needed uh, improve. So I've been very much concerned and involved in improving uh, the buildings uh, and the work environments uh, within the city. Um, within my uh, role as a uh, union president back in uh, Amherst, we had a uh, building that had um, the, the many employees were complaining about and experiencing um, some physical reactions, they believe, to the building. And there was a real resistance from the administration to admit that there could be a, a problem of that nature. And it really took a lot of advocacy um, over a, a fairly long period of time to, to get um, the administration to admit that indeed there was a mold problem. Because those are problems that you necessarily see. And one of the key factors there is the people factor. It's being in touch with the people and trusting them and listening to them so you can identify a problem. You can bring in a lot of experts and they won't necessarily detect some of the health and safety issues. So I definitely will work very closely with the employees to make sure that their environment is healthy and safe for, for them on their own. Yeah, definitely employee input is an important part and it's an example of the police station project. A lot of the early planning that went on were the architects and designers actually meeting with the sergeants, meeting with the patrolmen, meeting with the captains, meeting with them, and trying to get an understanding of what their workflows were, what the what what was needed for them to be able to do their work. And I think that's the model we should use in any of these situations, whether it's you know working with the city clerk and the and the registrar when we combined those offices and did some renovations in that office to try to figure out how do we create the smoothest workflow for people and how do we make it easier for customers to get in. So that's an important part of getting feedback not only from uh, the customers but also from the employees who are there, are in the building, and are doing the work every day. Thank you. We have, we have, one, one, we have one more question and then we're going to open it up to the, we told you to do that? Well then good. <laughs> so this is our last question and then we'll open it up to the audience. So in regard to collective bargaining, what do you see as positive or negative about secrecy in negotiations? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the word that I'm most familiar with uh, to describe uh, negotiations is confidentiality, not secrecy. Um, and it may look like secrecy from the outside. Um, the need for having some uh, confidentiality in uh, negotiations is that uh, quite often, depending on the community and the circumstances, um, public employees can be used as a political football. And I think it was to, you know, to give them some protection and some, uh, uh, out of a sense of respect to keep it out of some of the, uh, the politics that may be going on in that community. Um, comparable to the private sector, because private sector, there is confidentiality in negotiations. There, there is another model, um, there's probably a couple of models. There's a model that I'm familiar with is called, uh, often called fishbowl negotiations where it's open to the public, where members of the public can uh, to watch. They don't participate, but they watch. And if we want to look at something like this, I think it takes a lot of uh, discussion in terms of um, re-establishing uh, ground rules and 
trying to identify the benefits of that. But I think it's the, uh, it was initially really to protect uh, public employees, and it was out of uh, sort of the respect for the work they do, to not to have them also be uh, the center of some of the public criticisms at the same time, the negotiating a contract. I have negotiated contracts. It is hard work. Um, it takes a lot of time. As it can be very stressful. It's, um, uh, you have to be in communication with the people you represent. You have to be uh, constantly going back and forth, uh, talking to lawyers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a very, very demanding situation, and I, I know that from the inside out. So, um, changing the system for the better would be welcome, but we have to make sure that any change like that is indeed an improvement, and that people understand what, what the rules are. So in, so in terms of positives or negatives about secrecy, again, I would use the word confidential as well. It's a, it's a you know, collective bargaining is a legal framework. It's, it's part of the state law. It's part of the way that contract negotiations are done. Many of you are familiar with the open meeting law, which requires that all you know, public meetings be open, etc. Well, collective bargaining is one of the few exceptions to the open meeting law for the very reason that both uh, the employees as well as the city uh, need to maintain confidentiality in terms of what their bargaining position is and, and to be able, I think, to have a free flow of ideas and discussion um, that's not that immediately in the newspaper or immediately out all over, all over town. Um, so I think there are, there are different models to look at um, and I think that one of the issues around it is, you know, if the, uh, there's a new kind of model or new wave of thinking around collective bargaining, a model called collaborative bargaining which is uh, looking at trying to have an ongoing dialogue between management and between, uh, between the labor union um, to kind of try to work jointly on problems, to solve problems throughout the process. I think that's a, that, that to me would be a, a great model to look at. I know that the, I think the Boston Foundation just released a big study on it last week um, looking at could this be a, a way to kind of move away from the adversarial process that seems to have developed over time and can we try to uh, involve um, uh, have more teamwork moving forward to, to not wait till problems arise or conflicts arise but try to work together. I know uh, Mayor Menino in Boston uh, just negotiated sort of a five-year agreement with all of his labor unions around some key issues and that was a great example of collaborative bargaining where uh, got people together, talked about what their common issues were and rather than have these you know, every year kind of fights, let's reach some common ground and come together on sort of a five-year pact that then we can move forward and really deal with some of the tough issues together. Um, so I think that's a great example. But in terms of the secrecy piece or the confidentiality piece, again, I think for the, the downside, obviously, the negative is that people, the public feels like they don't know what's going on. But obviously, the positive part of it is that it maintains that confidentiality so that there can be a clear negotiation and employees' rights are respected and, and management is able to have a, a free-flowing discussion. In uh, negotiations in the uh, uh, public sector, because of the, the financial situation that we have been in for some time and we were going to be in, there will always be some conflict when it comes around uh, negotiation for, for wages. I mean, that, that's just built into to the system. Um, the, uh, in terms of dealing with other issues, uh, there are models for dealing with issues outside of negotiations. And I've been part of, uh, in the past of what's called a labor management Group where folks from the, uh, the the union or from the workforce sits down with a uh, uh, who's ever the um, the head of the uh, whether it's the school system or the the mayor or, or whatever the head of that particular entity is and talks about different issues that are affecting people and to come up with, with uh, solutions for those issues outside of negotiations so they don't all accumulate for that three year cycle two years ago for negotiations and that is definitely as I said earlier that is something that will implement in terms of having ongoing uh, talks with employees. Excellent, thank you. So we're going to open up the mic to questions from the audience and I know there's a question right here. <laughs> Wendy Fox and I live here in Ward 7 and I served with both of you on the Best Practices Committee. Um, question, sort of a two-part, but there, it's land, rule me out of order if, if you have to. Um, uh, during
hearing our word, and I continue to hear this, and before I serve on the committee, I hear from people all across the political spectrum here in the city about uh, their interest in getting involved but feeling like they couldn't find a way in to, to be appointed to the committee uh, to serve in some way. Um, could you both address um, what you've done, perhaps in the past, and or what you might do in the future to uh, create more access for people? And related to that, um, um, let's see, what was that question? Oh, with the charter reform that's underway, uh, what key issues do you see as important to bring forward in that process? If that's okay to sort of ask two questions, if not. Well, I guess you did, so thank you. Let me reset this now. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. The first part of your oh yeah, okay, the appointment process. Okay, great. Uh, so yeah, so one of the one of the things that we talked about in that report was the idea of how do we open up the appointment process? How do we make it easier for people to understand how to apply? I think that's a great thing. I think we need to do more of that. Um, we actually did one of the small recommendations in that report was making a better portal on the city's homepage for, for volunteers so that they have a quick way to, to get there and fill out an application. I'd like to be able to implement a system where we take all of the vacancies uh, that are coming up in a coming quarter or a coming six month period and have those posted so that people can see what are all the committees that are going to have upcoming vacancies so that people have an understanding. I think the past practice had been, you know, you fill out an application, you send it in, and if a vacancy opens or whatever, then you go ahead and get, you may get a call and, what, and, and that may be the way it works. I would want to really try to open it up, have those, have those openings, those vacancies listed so that people knew there's an opening coming up on the planning board, there's an opening coming up on the Arts Council, um, and I'm interested in art, so I want to apply. I also think it's really important to get out and try to use the many networks we have in the community to spread the word about that. We have great uh, neighborhood groups that have listservs that communicate with people in their neighborhoods. That's a great way uh, to put that out there. Many city councilors now have blogs or, or, uh, or email lists. We can use that to get the word out to people that, you know, anybody interested in serving on the planning board, you know, put in your application. I want to try to make it so that people know what the, uh, what the availability is. And in terms of my philosophy of appointing people, I think it's great to have as many different opinions on a, on a body as possible. And that's an area where I think I also disagreed with, um, with past practice in terms of you know, folks that have strong opinions or folks that have been critical of the process. To me, those are the best people to bring into the process and have them be on boards and committees to get them involved in city government, to get them, you know, they obviously are passionate and care about city government. Let's get them involved and get them on a committee so that they can start uh, contributing through our formal process. That's how I started in city government. I got appointed to the zoning board by Mary Ford. Uh, spent four years talking about setbacks and fences and tree lines and those kinds of things. And then uh, eventually moved up. So it's a great way to get people involved in city government. Sorry, you want to oh, yeah. <clears throat> I'm quick. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's Coincidental, yes, so many, uh, that uh, David mentioned Mary Ford, because when Mary Ford was first elected, one of the initial things she did, even before she was uh, sworn in, she set up a, uh, a very small committee to help her with the, uh, the appointment and recruitment process. And I chaired that, co chaired that effort along with uh, Maureen Tobin, um, who had worked for uh, uh, Mary's opponent. And we redid the whole process, we redid the application. Then we went out in the community and solicited people to uh, apply for those. And we really opened up what had been a very closed process. Um, that sort of uh, atrophied that over uh, the last 10 years. Um, the city council looked at that process and decided to uh, do an appointments committee to try to open it up some more and, and, and relook it. And that's been uh, partially uh, successful. But um, the, the problem is much more just than appointments. Um, as I go around the city and talk to people, a lot of people feel alienated and disconnected from the city. And I think we need to do outreach to pull people in before you go and hand them an application and say, apply to this committee. I think they need to feel connected to the city, that the city is listening to them, that they care about them. When I was uh, um, 
been going around in this, uh, this election season and talking to people at meet and greets, etc. I have um, met a number of people who have expertise from their careers, uh, whether it's around uh, water management, um, developing emergency programs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these are people who have uh, more than willing to work with the city. And in some cases, I've even volunteered verbally, but have never been tapped and pulled in. So I think we need to do that outreach and pull in people who feel like they're currently excluded and, and, and not listen to. And in terms of the charter, to me, the single most important issue is term limits, and especially for the mayor's uh, position, because I think that has created an imbalance in our city government, and we need to get some balance back. So I think term limits is the single most important uh, recommendation. There's a number of them, but to me, term limits. Uh, since I didn't talk about the charter, I'll use my rebuttal time to do that. Um, so yes, there is a charter drafting committee that's, that's working right now on trying to update our charter. I think it's a great process. I think one of the overarching issues that they need to work on is really making the document easier to understand, easier to read. There's a lot of old language. There's a lot of superfluous language that doesn't really belong in there. There's state laws that are in there that don't belong in there. There's stuff that really belong in the ordinance book. So as a starting point, really having a clear, easy to read document, that's, our, that's basically our constitution. That's the founding document of our city. So making it more accessible and then looking at some of the imbalances between the balance between the executive and the legislative branch and the many administrative and regulatory boards and making sure that those are all clearly delineated in a way that provides a balanced, fair government for people uh, here at the local level. Did, did you if both those questions were answered? If not, we'll get back to it. <laughs> Because I think the local businesses are at the heart of our economy. 
and um, is what we need to make sure we uh, are um, our prosperity in the future. Thank you. Oh yeah, I'm quick. I'm telling you. Are you playing any <laughs> birds or not? <laughs> I better reset this. Spider now. Eight there. seconds in. Okay. Just making sure. Good. Okay. Thank you. I just want to make sure the time is yep. reset. Um, so I, this is something that I worked on. Again, I was an economic development director for John Olvers. So this is a, a, an area that I have some experience and expertise in. I think one of the things we need to really do is have a plan, have a strategy. Uh, not be reactive, but be proactive. One of the things I've called for is the formation of an economic development advisory commission in the city. Uh, we've done really well with transportation and energy by putting together commissions that bring in outside experts, that bring in citizens uh, to really focus on an issue. I think economic development is one that deserves that and we need to have that focus. Um, I think in terms of other things we can work on, I think uh, looking at zoning, we're right now in the middle of a process to, ref to uh, update and reform our King Street zoning, which is directly aimed at taking that uh, potential business corridor and making sure that we have more flexibility and we have, um, uh, have it zoned in a way that reflects the different character of the different parts of the street and allows for different uses so we can try to bring in um, possibly more types of businesses to that area. Uh, in terms of other areas of zoning, we have a lot of entrepreneurs and people that work at home. So home occupations is an issue that we've been looking at in the zoning. I think that's another way, uh, especially with many people that now telecommute and work from computers. It gives them the ability to run businesses out of their home. I was actually at the Leeds uh, picnic earlier this summer. I was talking to a, a young man who was starting a software business right here in Leeds out of his house. Uh, it was really working on ramping that up and, and doing web design and things like that. So these are, these are people that are working, entrepreneurs right in their neighborhoods, and we need to be able to help them and support them. I also think we have to work on supporting our local businesses. Um, one of the things we did uh, in Congressman Olver's office was a business visitation program, and I think the city used to have a similar program like that, where we on a regular basis were out eating with local businesses and trying to understand the needs that they have and trying to get information about them so we have a better understanding um, when we put in place policies for, for how it impacts them and how we can support them. Um, and finally, regional. Uh, we, you know, we're here in Northampton, but we're also part of a region. There are regional opportunities that we have to explore. The University of Massachusetts, which is one of our largest employers, there's a lot of potential for regional um, economic development. We have this Knowledge Corridor project with the train coming back. I think that has some great regional potential. We have this Holyoke Computing Center. So there's a lot of also regional things. So the mayor has to be looking not only at home, but also has to be out looking for opportunities outside of Northampton as well. Um, quickly for a 30 second rebuttal, uh, two points. Um, one is the, uh, the train as a, uh, a resident who used to live in uh, Connecticut uh, mentioned to me, it can be a two-way sword because they can take people out of the community as easily as they bring people in. And what we need is to make sure is everybody uh, loves to live in Northampton, but the jobs, a lot of the uh, jobs are not here, the, the jobs that people need. So um, a lot of communities have turned into um, bedroom communities because people leave to go get jobs elsewhere and then come back to live here. So we need to make sure we need to be proactive and provide a job. And we need to look at the people aspect of that, not just policies. I have gone around downtown and I've talked with the business owners downtown and in Leeds. They feel very disconnected from city government. They will tell you that. And there's a lot of uh, dissatisfaction. So I think we can do a lot to improve our uh, relationships with our current business owners. Either, either one. <laughs> Whichever would like to go first. Uh, my name is Fred Stockwell. I'm a resident here in Leeds. I also own a, a store in Northampton. And I feel like uh, Northampton is very vibrant at this point. It's a great place to, to have a business. Um, I've never seen either counselor in my store talking to me. <laughs> for the last 30 years, but that's exactly <laughs> um, But uh, downtown business improvement, the business improvement district uh, is something that I have noticed has been something that's really helped uh, the downtown businesses. There's, the streets are cleaner, they're talking about uh, getting people in there to be ambassadors to help uh, make it so that it's, uh, it feels safer on the streets. 
And I'd just like to, to know clearly, because my vote's going to really depend on this, uh, just how each of you stand on uh, supporting the business improvement district and renegotiating that. You know, so if it would be a yes or no answer, would be great. <laughs> My answer is yes. I, I supported the bid, um, and I supported the bid uh, wholeheartedly when it came before the city council. Um, I think it was a, it's a great concept. I mean, uh, at a time when the National Chamber of Commerce has a very different political bent, our local Chamber of Commerce, I'm proud to say, is saying we'd like to have the ability to raise our own taxes so that we can make improvements in our downtown business district. It's been a great model. It's worked in many other places. Um, and it was interesting to see yesterday, uh, or in the paper today, that Amherst just fairly unanimously adopted it for Amherst, a similar set of business owners who want to uh, preserve and make improvements in their downtown. I do think the city has an important role to play in that. I did have an opportunity to meet with the bid board of directors to talk about my views on that and my candidacy. I think the city, as one of the largest uh, you know, landowners downtown, does have to play a big role in helping that process in the, in the ways that we've negotiated. Um, and I think that uh, going forward, you know, the work that's been done so far around keeping the streets clean and, and, the, and the decorations and the lighting and all the wonderful amenities that people are starting to notice uh, when they come downtown, you know, the next wave of it is the ambassador program, it's the marketing program, it's those kinds of things. And I think it's been a positive thing for downtown. I think it also, you know, again, allows business owners to do some of the things that the city could not afford to do. Uh, and, but we also have to be a partner to make sure that the things that we've agreed to do, whether it's the snow removal or whether it's the, uh, you know, providing the, the infrastructure support downtown or the police, those kinds of things, you know, we have to be part of that process as well because it's a, it's a great benefit to us. I mean, the investment that, that local uh, business uh, property owners are making in downtown is an incredible investment, not only in their own property, but it's an incredible investment in the city and the community and the economic health of our, of our wonderful Downtown. So, yes, and actually, I was in your store actually the other day getting a coffee. So I just think you weren't there. But, so. but anyway, uh, that's my answer. Uh, short answer: Yes, um, I support the bid. I think they have made a uh, remarkable improvement downtown in several uh, aspects uh, in terms of cleanliness and improved safety in some areas. Uh, through lighting and also around the, uh, the holidays, so definitely it's, it's been an improvement. Um, in terms of the, uh, my concern when it was uh, brought before us, and I had concerns with the contract of the uh, Memorandum of Understanding, is that the city was um, uh, agreeing to do in that contract things we should have been doing anyways. It wasn't a matter of whether or not we could afford to do them, we had a responsibility and for maintaining the sidewalks, the plumbing, the roads, et cetera, et cetera. And that should never have been part of the bid. Um, I met with the bid board of directors uh, within the last uh, two and a half weeks, and they had a series of questions that they gave to both candidates that was written uh, ahead of time. And uh, my response, I said, in looking at this, it seems to be that the bid uh, board of directors um, has some discontent with uh, the way, frustration with the way the city's been handling the bid. And um, they, they agreed that the, even though some of those responsibilities are now in writing, they are not being accomplished any more easily um, than they were before that memorandum of understanding. And that's exactly why I have the problem with it, because the problem isn't with the lack of the document, the problem was with the leadership. Downtown, who understands downtown, who will go around and talk to the business people. I have a history of doing it. I did it as a board councilor when I uh, formed an ad hoc business committee that addressed a number of the problems with the business owners. Um, and in terms of uh, your store, but that's where I buy my vitamins, so, <laughs> which I probably need after this election. <laughs> Uh, the only thing I'll say is, uh, just as an example, I, I think the communication piece between the bid and the city is key. Uh, and, uh, last, was it last week or earlier this week, we had our annual snow preparation meeting, which is our citywide planning effort for how we're going to deal with snow. 
uh, and snow removal and all the other issues. And, and we had a representative from the bid at that meeting because we felt that it was important to have them there because they are doing a lot of the snow removal downtown. Um, and in, in addition to that, I made a promise that we would get together, we'd have a separate meeting with uh, the folks that are coordinating the snow removal downtown as well as uh, our street superintendent uh, so that they can have better coordination. I know in the early couple of years there were some snafus around that, but I think the key is to get people together, get the street, because again, it's, it's helpful to the city to have the folks that are clearing out the crosswalks by the bidder doing that, they're clearing the sidewalks, and one just want to get good coordination so that it all happens in harmony with the plows when they come through. So that's important, I'm committed to that, and it's a great partnership that we should really work on and build on as we move forward. Thank you. Right here. The question was semi-asked, but uh, it, it was a semi-answered as well. <laughs> In regards to the union contracts, you have both stated that the majority of the salary is made up of by personnel. The, the, the majority of the cost of running the city goes to people's salaries. There is such a thing as the Freedom of Information Act. It trumps just about everything. It entitles you to, to look at contracts. We, as the citizens of this city, have a good regard for the city employees, but we want to know what's going on with the contracts, what the terms are, and I'm sure we will see to it that the city workers are taken care of. But I'm particularly, the thing that's shocking me nuts here is in regards to the firemen's stipends that that is going to be behind closed doors. And it seems the Freedom of Information Act entitles, if we're talking about open government, entitles us all to learn about the details. There's uh, two issues here. One issue is the, the negotiation of a contract, which is currently um, something that is, uh, is protected by confidentiality. And then once the contract is negotiated, the availability of that document. That document should be readily available. That is a public document. And that, I think, is where the problem has been in, in, the, uh, in the past, is that uh, that document is, there are some communities where that document is um, online, you can um, access it. So that definitely should be something that is readily available. Um, in terms of the, uh, the particular contract you make reference to, the firefighters and the, the stipends, um, there's a clause in that uh, contract that I think should have had a discussion with the council finance committee um, because it's a new concept, just as a concept, not in terms of negotiations. And what the clause says is it identifies after monies have been spent for the operation of the ambulance service and um, paying the personnel and the stipends, there's a uh, reference to excess revenue. A very unusual concept in the public sector, excess revenue, and then a mechanism for profit sharing. Um, that, is, that was negotiated. Uh, the council did, it was not privy to that. That was negotiated by, by the mayor. And so I think that we need to kind of look at that because um, I don't understand how we can have excess revenue in one part of the city and then um, taking away teachers' uh, step raises in, in, in another part of the city. So that is definitely something that um, should be discussed, those type of concepts. Um, but once the, the uh, document has been agreed to, it is, uh, should be available to the public as part of the public domain. I agree about having the signed contracts available online. I've actually pushed to try to have uh, city contracts put on the website. Uh, city salaries are now on the website. That's something that's only happened in the last couple of years. Um, I think it's important to have all that information available. Um, in terms of the issue of the stipends that you referenced, uh, so uh, that was actually, that, that concept that's been referred to was actually negotiated first in 2004 when the city first went into the ambulance business, and that's been carried over in successive contracts right up to the current contract, so it's not a new concept. Uh, and, but it is something that definitely, the, 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 what's different about it though is that it, it had never actually been triggered until the last couple of years. Uh, in, the, in the beginning in 2004, there had been no triggering of that particular clause. Uh, and so it was only in the last couple of years that the stipends went above and beyond 
the first phase of the contract and went into this next phase. Again, I think that's a legitimate issue to talk about in collective bargaining uh, with the, with the, with the uh, employees about that, especially based on the feedback that we received from the public. In terms of the actual council vote that took place on it, um, we, we did have a discussion of it, and in fact, Councillor Tacey uh, got out his calculator and made an amendment to try to reduce those stipends that night uh, by a certain amount, but there was not a majority of councillors who agreed on that concept, and so we, it was not accepted. So there wasn't actually a discussion and a vote on it, um, and again, my, my belief at the time was we were paying people for work that they had done for the previous year as part of a contract that had been in place since 2004, that had been, you know, that was under negotiation right now, and that, you know, that, that if we want to have a discussion of it, then we need to do the key parts of it in, in collective bargaining out of fairness to those employees. Um, but again, the, the city council has the ability to cut, to increase, to not accept whatever uh, dollar figures come out of collective bargaining. But this is an issue that we're hearing about, and that in, as mayor, if I'm involved in the next collective bargaining, this will be an issue that I'll take up with the firefighters, is, is looking at that stipend system again, and seeing whether it's still applicable now that we have a fully formed and fully grown EMS system, as opposed to the fledgling one that started out back in 2004, when there was a lot of risk on both sides. Can I just point out another flaw? Section 87.2c of the Freedom of Information Act does suggest that until the contract is signed, yeah. 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 sorry. Yeah. 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 Next question. Thank you. Well, he gets uh, to the rebuttal. Oh, yeah, rebuttal. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I was getting nervous. The um, the night that uh, all three votes occurred on um, approving the stipend was not the first time that the issue of the uh, excess revenue and the profit sharing was brought up. It had been brought up um, several meetings uh, prior, and um, the mayor, uh, Mayor Higgins, uh, interrupted Jeans from I believe Councilor Tacey, and said that was something for an executive session. I don't think that exec executive session, in terms of informing the councilors around the aspects of, of the contract and how that all happened, that never occurred. And Jean can correct me if I'm wrong, but so. That was brought up well ahead of the time of, of that vote, and that is something that could have been done and wasn't. Yes. Hi, um, my question is about um, bike paths, and um, we seem to have quite a few now, at least more from when I was a child. And I'd like to know if you think that there is any type of um, negative impacts from these bike paths. And also, um, if you could tell me who um, paid to remove all the graffiti from the $4 million bike path that we just installed. Because I noticed there's additional graffiti there. So I'm just wondering who's paying to continue to remove it. And if there's any negative impacts to these bike paths. Okay, so um, in terms of the first question about the graffiti uh, on the, on, I believe you're talking about the bridge structure over Route 10. That's actually the state's bridge is in the state layout, so I believe they may have been dealing with the graffiti. I don't know the exact answer though, and I can try to find that out for you, but my understanding was that they were taking care of that as part of that project. I know that they're also working on applying some kind of a treatment to it uh, to try to make it difficult for people to put graffiti. And I know we're also talking about maybe some plantings or something along it to also inhibit that. Um, in terms of the bike trail system, I, mean, I think it's been a, a positive thing for the city. I think it's, um, it provides not only alternative transportation for people that want to get around the city uh, safely and, and in a more efficient way. It also has a, it's been a, a sort of an eco-tourism um, aspect for the city as well. I'm amazed when I'm out there, we did a cleanup uh, uh, this spring of a section of the, of the trail where I live, and I'm just amazed by the number of people on that trail. You know, and, and many of them from out of town were coming to Northampton to spend the weekend to you know, stay at a bed and breakfast or eat in restaurants, enjoy the trails. And we also had a lot of kids that are using them to get to school. Uh, I know that uh, the Jackson Street School area, I know that um, 
I know that the new bike path up in Leeds has also been a way for children to get to school. Um, and, and so there's many different benefits to it. Um, we do have to think about, as we move forward, how do we maintain it? What are the, what are the ways that we are able to, uh, to maintain the system and keep it open for people, and keep it safe for people? We have a great organization in town called the Friends of Northampton Trails and Greenways, which has been kind of a, an organization that's, that's rose up to try to support the trail system. They've raised money to pay for many improvements, to pay for signage, to pay for signals. Um, so that's been a great sort of public-private partnership for the many people that support the trails and think that they've been beneficial to the city. Um, again, I think it's been very beneficial and I think uh, you know, North Hampton has been a leader in that regard and I'm very proud of that. The, uh, the first committee uh, was formed for implementing uh, rail trails and, and doing the initial plan um, had two councils on it, myself and Councilor Ray Lavarch from Ward 7, who was a great champion of uh, rail trails. And um, he oftentimes took uh, positions that not all of his constituents agreed with regarding rail, rail, rail trails. So Ray and I worked on uh, rail trails in, in the initial uh, planning part of it. Um, there is expenses around uh, upkeep. Uh, plowing, I heard a lot of concerns about trying to keep them open during the winter, and there are often safety issues. And we, those are considerations that we need to keep in mind when we're looking in the future for additional uh, rail trails. Um, I remember um, on the council when I served with uh, Jim Dosville, and whenever we were approving, uh, acquiring a piece of uh, land for open space, um, Jim always used to ask the question, well, what are the maintenance costs that, um, attached to that? Is that going to be coming back to haunt the city in some way? Are we going to have some other costs? And so I think that's one of the things that we have to do with anything, whether it's building a building or uh, putting in a rail trail. Look at the ongoing maintenance responsibilities that we have. And um, another thing that the city uh, doesn't do uh, uh, very often now on some issues is evaluating our decisions. So going back, looking at the decision, what did we do right, what could have been improved, what did we learn from this, and we need to uh, do that when we're looking at our uh, rail trails and any other uh, measures that we're, we're doing. So I think we can do better at looking at that. Um, uh, but overall, I think it's a, a big asset for the city. Um, it's great for uh, recreation. It, is a, it brings people here. It's an attraction. And so we, make, we have to make sure that they are not an inconvenience and a safety hazard for other people who are uh, living by, uh, by them. In the interest of time, I'm just going to go on, let you go on to the next question. Jeff Massimino, Ward 4. Uh, first, I'd like to thank both of you guys for the kind comments on the lights on the people that hangs them. <laughs> and uh, my question deals with the education of the district around Smith College. I have a quick background question. Sorry, I'll try to make it brief. I used to live at 21 Belmont Avenue, and a few years ago I watched as my former neighborhood was dismantled to make way for Smith College's new science building. <clears throat> now Smith College has told the current residents of 21 Belmont that they have a year to get out and it's going to be turned into a parking lot. So my question for you is this, are both of you, as mayor, one of those current residents comes up to you with a question, or ask for help, are you trying to do something for them, <coughs> even if it's just to like stand up for them, or do you get what I heard from Mayor Higgins, which was, there's nothing I can do, my hands are tied. Thank you. Well, the, uh, the quote that you just made uh, of, um, from Mayor Higgins was in reference, um, I believe, to the Dover Amendment, which gives um, some added uh, authority to an educational uh, institution in terms of the, go moving forward and not having to go through the same process that a, uh, a private entity or a commercial entity would have. Uh, mayor's hands may be tied. Um, but my time won't be tied. We can talk to Smith. And that's one of the things that was missing, is that ongoing dialogue about what their plans were and how it was going to impact that neighborhood. Essentially, a very key neighborhood 
has been uh, dismantled, or is in the process of being dismantled. A lot of those have, uh, buildings have changed hands. Um, Smith is now the owner. They, they are letting them, you know, phasing them out as rental properties and taking them down. That is having an impact on um, the city, and that's like especially downtown Northampton, that section of the city. Um, I don't think there was enough dialogue and public dialogue. The, the contract that was negotiated um, between the mayor's office and Smith, um, from my knowledge, had two people in the room, and the, people, the city council was not made aware of that process until it was a done deal and it was already uh, signed. So um, I think that the mayor needs to take leadership and have a dialogue with all the major institutions about what the needs are for the city, what the plans are for the city, and to make sure that their plans are in keeping with that. And um, there are some aspects of the Smith plan that uh, I think runs counter to what the, uh, the concerns are for the city at large, and we needed to have dialogue around that. So I would definitely have done that differently, and as you know, I worked very closely with the residents. They came forward because they uh, city councilor recused himself from the process and they had no representation. That's a great question, Jeff, and, and not only um, uh, you know, do, I, do I care about the issue, but I actually have actually reached out to Smith College about this very issue. Um, I had a, a meeting with them. It's a regular meeting that happens with the mayor on a monthly basis. I've been c continuing those kinds of meetings. Um, and, and it was on the, my list of questions for them, or what were the status of those properties. For folks who don't understand what's going on, there's a couple of properties that they um, uh, would like to take down in that neighborhood near the Science Center. Um, the Historic Commission has determined that they are historic structures and have implemented the city's demolition delay, which means they can't take them down for one year. So that's, in, that's put in place in order to give the opportunity for the community for if there's someone out there that's a historic preservation uh, person that wants to try to acquire the property, you know, to try to create an alternative scenario um, for taking down the property. Maybe there's someone that can move it, et cetera. So I did have a discussion with them about that, and I've encouraged them to, to try to be proactive. They have, had many, they have had some inquiries from people who wanted to look at the building and look at the structures, um, and I've encouraged them to be proactive about that. And definitely, um, you know, I, I would try to work with the folks that are affected by that change to make sure that we can try to assist them uh, if the ultimate decision is that, that the buildings come down. Again, it's privately owned property. Um, they're going through the zoning process that we put in place. The demolition delay was put in place for this very reason so that there'd be kind of a cooling off period so that people just couldn't de de demolish a, a historic home. And so I'm hopeful that in between now and next spring that there may be a solution uh, to that that serves the interests of both Smith and, and the neighborhood and, and preserving a historic home. Still at 10 seconds. <laughs> And I want to thank David for um, his appreciation of the demolition de delay ordinance. I was the, the co-author and the sole sponsor of that ordinance, getting it through the council. And it was, um, it had a lot of opposition. It was, some folks did not like that. And there was a lot of question. We, we worked on it. But um, it has been effective. So I had the, the vision and the, and the courage to push that through. So I'm, I'm glad it's working. behind the candidates, but, uh, uh, so my question is, uh, Councilor Narkowitz, uh, last Monday's debate, you mentioned that you felt that Claire had given you a, quote, raw deal by forcing you to act as mayor while also running as mayor. Uh, given that uh, conflict, will you commit to serving only one term if elected so that you can continue <laughs> serving the city through the next election season in 2013? <laughs> I'm not really sure I understand the question. I, mean, I, uh, I was asked about um, whether there had been some kind of a deal, and I basically said, well, if there had been a deal, I kind of got the raw end of it. Um, because I was, you know, having to serve as acting mayor, I was also trying to run city council as council president, and also try to run a campaign for mayor. 
that was the context in which I said that. Um, in terms of, I'm still a little perplexed by your question. You want me to only, only if serve you have so much trouble for two you know, years. Will you, will you commit not to run again to have that comment again? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm usually I usually can understand most of these questions. That one I'm a little stumped at, but. Um, but thank you for asking it, and I'm happy to talk with you about it afterwards, uh, just to try to better understand it and, and give you an answer. Sorry. I think the point behind that tiny cheap question was that every incumbent has to uh, go through a re-election campaign and do their their office, whether they're mayor or not. So it's something that people face all the time. And in the uh, when you're a city councilor, for many of us who are working at paid employment, that um, have, we have that responsibility for a nine to five job, plus uh, running a campaign, and plus the responsibilities of the office. So those are things that people have to learn how to juggle those demands on them, and I, I think that was the, probably the, the point of that, that question. Um, but it, it, and it is, it is really difficult, and uh, but, um, I think that is also part of the responsibilities you take on when you say yes. Again, I, I guess uh, I think I'm better understanding now. You're saying that as an incumbent, I should. Uh, anyway, I'm going to stop there. We'll talk now. I'm still for the last time. Thank you. I would defer to any Ward Seven resident since I'm from Ward One. I didn't see anybody else's hand up, so you're up. Nice gesture. Thank you. Howdy. My name's Susco, Steve Susco. I'm from Ward 1. We seem to be debate challenged in Ward 1, so thank you for letting me participate in yours. And I'd like to suggest a question for someone else. Uh, maybe you could ask the candidates to dream out loud about Northampton six years hence, and there might be an implicit uh, term limit in there. I don't know. My question is a little more practical comes from this afternoon. Uh, I recently requested time with the Board of Public Works for on their, on their agenda in order to support a claim that I have against the city. Uh, I was in, been working on that uh, for tomorrow, tomorrow night's meeting. I was informed this afternoon that I will, I am not allowed on the agenda. If you become mayor, when will you stop this kind of shenanigans? Thank you. Well, I don't know the specifics of, of the meeting and why that decision was made. If um, you were originally notified that that was going to be the meeting and there isn't a, a legal reason, there may very well be a legal reason in terms of the, uh, the lawyer for the city needing more time. I, I'm not sure on the dynamics, but it is something that should be communicated clearly ahead of time. And as I said, there, there needs to be, on all of the city uh, uh, decisions, there need to be a clear process laid out in the very beginning of how a decision is going to be made. Um, I dealt with, uh, you know, Mr. Susco, with the first part of, of this problem when we came to the city council. Um, with the concern of a fourth backup from the city sewer system into your basement. And the, um, uh, the city did not respond very well to you at that time. There's been a, been a history there of your being aggravated by the, uh, the treatment from the city and the lack of response and attention. And I, I think in your case it is justified because I've, I've been there, I, I've seen it. So I can understand the frustration. Um, I think we need to build in a policies and treatment of, of citizens that are um, proactive, um, that treat them with respect, that and that responds immediately um, to, a, to an issue that is brought forward. Um, for example, at the city council, people can bring forward issues at the city council and they get no response. And I think that is something that should come to an end. People need not necessarily at the meeting. But after the meeting, someone should have contacted you 
and uh, come up with a plan uh, for addressing that problem. And uh, um, uh, the treatment that you have is really not has experienced from my point of view is really uh, unexcusable. Uh, again, I don't know the specifics of that process. So we have a claims process at the City Council, which I know you've sat through several times, uh, and uh, where we have a we have applicants come up and they're allowed to talk and explain their claim and give us the background information. We have people bringing in tires. We have you know, all kinds of stuff that we, we hear. We hear from different sides. We uh, we also have the city's attorney there. I don't know how that process works, but I, I think that we should have that clearly explained to people so that when they file a claim, they understand what the process is, how much time they'll be allotted, etc. Um, and I think in terms of, uh, of you know, going forward, I think uh, we've had the opportunity, I wasn't able to work with you on that sewer issue, uh, but I have worked with you on other issues uh, related to some DPW matters as well as related to a larger citywide public policy issue uh, regarding truck brakes. And I think you have seen the way that I work with people, that I work collaboratively with people, I'm willing to work with anybody who has a good idea for solving a problem. And I think that's the approach we should take as city government is uh, working with people to try to solve problems collectively, collaboratively, and try to find solutions. So, um, you know, I don't know the specifics. I'm willing to investigate and find out what's happening with that particular issue, but I really can't speak to it tonight without knowing the background and details. Uh, there are two claims committees in the, uh, the city. One is out of DPW that have, um, deals with sewer and water related claims. The other one is with the Ordinance Committee, and as a long term chair of the Ordinance Committee, um, I headed that up and I want to kind of respond or piggyback on a comment that uh, David made about we get all kinds of uh, presentations. And there was one uh, meeting of the Claims Committee one summer, and there were about five or six claims, a number of people in there, and they each did their presentations. Show it. There were a couple of show and tell people in back it's garbage or a piece of a tree that fell on the roof. One person actually sang their uh, their presentation on a guitar, and after all that was done, there was one person sitting in the audience, and I said to her, "I'm sorry, this we've gone through our agenda," and she said, um, "Well, oh no, I don't have an item on the agenda." She said. Um, uh, I, I, was, I found out quickly it was in the wrong meeting, but she said, this was more open down entertaining than Oprah. I couldn't leave. So that was the nature that really happened. So that was the nature of it. We really tried to have an open process, and we did that on the ordinance committee. Fortunately, I can't sing. Fortunately. <laughs> I have a mic. I'm gonna, not going to add any more. Oh, I'm sorry. No, thank you. So, um, we thank you all for coming. We're going to call this to an end closing. now, closing. And we're going to do closing statements, um, two minute closing statements, and we're going to start with Mr. Narkowitz. I want to again thank Ward 7 Councilor uh, Tacey for putting together tonight's event with the uh, Lead Civic Association. I also want to say a special thank you to my wife, Yelna, um, who's uh, attended most of these debates, and, and also to my daughters Emma and Zoe at home for their love and support. Northampton is an excellent place to live, to learn, to work, to run a business, and to raise a family. I'm running for mayor because I want to keep Northampton strong, and I want to keep, make it better. During my three terms on the city council, I've been a positive and productive representative and a city leader. I've never shied away from tough issues or hard work. I've brought people together to create innovative solutions and tangible results to improve our community. Since announcing my candidacy, I've knocked on hundreds of doors and sat in dozens of kitchens and living rooms across our city, listening and sharing ideas, and discussing my vision for creating economic opportunity and jobs, keeping our city livable and affordable, maintaining strong public schools, delivering smart and cost-effective city services, protecting our environment and keeping Northampton green and sustainable, fostering active neighborhood and citizen participation, and leading a government that is open, fair, and transparent. This election is a critical one for our city and presents a stark choice. There will always be real disagreements. The question is, how do we resolve them? Are we going to be stuck in the past, pointing fingers and dwelling on old fights and differences? Or do we choose to look forward, talk about the future of our city, and decide how to work together to reach our shared goals? Northampton needs a mayor with a positive vision and a steady, proven track record of leadership and results. 
a mayor who will unite our city and work hard every day for all of its people to find innovative solutions to the challenges we face. I am the candidate with the experience, the ideas, the energy, and the commitment to offer a new generation of leadership to move our great city forward. Thank you all for coming tonight, and I hope I can earn your vote for mayor on November 8th. I want to uh, thank the uh, members of the audience for being here tonight and staying for the duration. Uh, voters are victorious this year. You are facing the challenge of filling a position left vacant. I propose to you that I am the candidate with the strongest resume. First, I have 33 years as a professional educator in the public schools, a classroom teacher, guidance counselor, department head, administrator. Second, I have over 20 years experience as a public servant in our city's government. Third, I have a proven record of leadership in a variety of circumstances. Uh, three, uh, eight years as city council president, including several uh, stints as acting mayor. A solid track record as an advocate for quality public education. In 1999, I believe it was, I received uh, Northampton Teachers Association, one of their Friends of Education Award. A tireless champion for human and civil rights for all. In 2008, I won the uh, Martin Luther King Award for Citizen of the Year. I've been a union leader advocating for economic and social justice for working people. As employers, I urge you to compare our resumes, and I think they can, they're uh, re reflected rather nicely in our uh, campaign brochures that we have put out. I think they both make statements about who we are and what we stand for, and I think they're very different. I am the candidate who is best positioned to be the agent for change that we so desperately need. I am the candidate who has the heart, the soul, and the courage to take stands on challenging issues. And I pledge that I will be everybody's mayor, open to all. I ask you for your vote on November 8th. Thank you very much. I think there's a few more lunch kids if somebody wants to put some in their pockets to take them home.